Welcome back to another episode of the Pax What She Said podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Perry Goldstein, and I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Maggie Loney. Uh, I apologize in advance for my voice today. Um, it is attempting to be spring in New York. We're not getting the warm <laughs> weather, but we're getting the allergies. So <laughs> please bear with me. Um, but we're here <clears throat> because we're going to talk about some offensive draft prospects. Draft is, it's April, so it's draft month. We're here. Uh, but before we get started, Meg, how are you doing? Well, you said you had some rain. We had snow this week in Wisconsin. <laughs> and my favorite joke has been April showers bring snow flowers. I saw that and I thought that was so funny. So it is also attempting to be spring here by just dumping snow. Yeah, it's very fun. Um, you know, we had we have this thing in New York where, um, not to go on a bit of a tangent, but we always say that we have 12 seasons in New York City. <laughs> um, and one of them is fake spring. And then we get a new, and then we get rain, and then we get a winter, and then we get real spring. So we've had our fake spring, we've had our rain, and now it's April, and it's 33 degrees out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back in our second winter, and hopefully we get real spring soon. Um, but, like I said, it is April, it is draft season. I mean, it is fully, fully draft season. So we're getting close. We are here today, this week, to focus on some offensive draft prospects that the Packers can take. Now, we know that they have picked 25. However, it has been heavily rumored that the Packers are looking to trade up. Um, we spoke, if you listen to last week's episode, that we feel like the chances that they stay at 25 are pretty low. Um, typically, the Packers trade back, but... You know, Goot has been straying from the norm, so he likes to move around, and he has the ammo to do it this year, especially moving up, package some picks. So the rumor is that both the Packers, Eagles, and Washington have all discussed trading up to grab the Seahawks spot. So thoughts here on the Packers moving up? Yeah, so I'm, I pulled up the the Rich Hill draft value chart just because I think it gives like a good kind of rough estimate of what that would require for the Packers. And it would obviously take pick 25 and then probably pick 58. I don't think they would have to give up 41, which is nice, but they would be giving up a late second round or potentially an early third. So if there's somebody they're in love with, and I think that's kind of where this conversation is headed, right, is... I think it's value because the Packers feel like they're pretty close. And if you, you have these extra picks this year, we talked during free agency, right? If there was potential that the Packers might trade away some of those picks. So if there's somebody that you think is like a franchise altering player that will put you over the hump, giving up one of your second round picks is not too much to, to get up that high. So me personally, I think the options here would be a tackle or potentially one of the best corners because I don't see either of those positions sliding all the way to 25 where the Packers are. So curious what kind of position you think they'd be targeting there as well. I agree with you. I think in any other year, I'd put edge in that conversation, but considering they took Lucas Van Ness last season, um, I'd probably put that as a stretch. You never know. Um, but there are very few positions that, just get valued that high um, in the first round. The Packers don't normally take any other positions. Look, they they obviously took a Quay Walker, um, but they don't really value an inside linebacker. I don't think this is also the year where they take an inside linebacker in the first round. It's certainly not the year where, you know, the year that they took Quay was a year where there just happened to be like super high freaky athlete inside linebackers that were all going in the first round. This is not that season. Um, this is not the season where they take a safety in the first round, nor is it ever really the season where they take a safety in the first <laughs> round. Um, so when you look at historically what the Packers value, you know, you obviously put quarterback in that conversation, but that is not a need. So we're taking that off the table. Um, you know, you're kind of left with the three positions that we just listed. And like I said, you kind of take edge off the board, um, considering that they're kind of stacked. But again, if they have someone valued high and that's just the last person left on their board. And that's just the way the cookie crumbled on night one. 
I wouldn't be surprised. But for me, given both need and value, I'm with you. It's tackle and corner. Yeah. And I mean, I think edge is really interesting because I could see that being their first round selection, but I would have seen it a lot more if they stay at 25, because I think there's a real likelihood that somebody falls. Maybe Chop Robinson is the guy that slides. Like there will be, I think, some edge rushers that slide because we know that there's certain teams trying to trade up to get into the quarterback conversation. You know, the Vikings are in that conversation to potentially move up maybe with the chargers. There's some teams trying to trade back. I know one of the rumors was that the Cardinals are looking to trade back. So I think the front 15 ish picks are really stacked here on quarterbacks, wide receivers and tackles. So maybe the Packers are like, Hey, some defensive pieces are going to slide. And that's their thought process is there's going to be a really good corner that's going to be available for us. But I think more so it's, Hey, if we want to get our guy at tackle, we should do so. And I think it just makes sense regardless. I know they're confident in Rashid Walker. I know they like Zach Tom, but Zach Tom can play anywhere. I think he deserves the starting spot at right tackle. I think Rashid Walker played well, you know, especially in the playoffs at left tackle. But if you can go get one of the premier prospects and have more versatility on your line, they always say best five, right? And if best five means putting Zach Tom at right guard and then solidifying that entire side of your offense. Yeah. I mean, like I'm, I'm okay with it. 100%. I agree with you. I do think you bring up an interesting point being like what they would have to give up to move up. And I think the idea that they wouldn't have to give up 41 is also huge because what you can get at 41 versus 58 is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Um, You think about the players that get picked at the top of the second round. I mean, you look every season are the guys that you're like, how did they make it out of the first round? You know, how did they make it to the top of the second round? I mean, you look at Christian Watson, right? They had to move up, obviously, to go get Christian Watson, but he got taken early day two. Um, He was projected to be a first round wide receiver. So having 41 at their disposal as well means that they can probably get two super premium picks um, without really having to do give up all that much. Um, and that's thanks to the trade with Aaron Rodgers. Thank you, Jets. Um, <laughs> so you brought up tackles, offensive line, period. That position has been a huge talking point this offseason as just like a major need. I think it's a fair, it's fair because the rest of this offense looks pretty damn good, right? <laughs> um, stacked wide receiver room. Likely need to take a running back, but again, looking at value and this draft, that's probably not where they're going in the first round. So let's take a look at some offensive linemen. Um, There are definitely some names that have been associated with the Packers all this offseason. Just because names are associated with a team does not mean that's where they're going. We know this. Even when they (laughs) go in for a top 30 visit, doesn't mean that that's where they're going. However, we would be remiss to not talk about them. So... What are some of those names? Who do you have your eye on? And is there anyone that has not been associated that you like a lot? So I I wish I had the numbers in front of me. Every year I think like I should start a draft folder of all these great tweets and resources and have them ready for when we podcast. And I always forget to do that. But last year, I think it was Paul Brettel. We had looked at the numbers, right, of how many players had come in on top 30 visits and Brian Gutekunst really does his due diligence. And I think of like the 10 picks they made, like seven of them had come in for visits. So he values those picks a lot or those, uh, those visits a lot as far as getting to know prospects. What I thought was interesting so far is of the like 10 rumored top 30 visits, only two of them have been offensive. So he's got like, he's got his eyes on the defense, primarily D line linebacker and safety, which is not surprising. Um, But one of the names that was a rumored top 30 visit hasn't been confirmed is Tyler Guyton, the Oklahoma tackle who could potentially be a first rounder will probably be there at 25. So that would be interesting to me because if the Packers don't find a trade partner, I think they could sit right where they're at and he would be there for them. He's six, seven, 322 pounds, 9.71 relative athletic score. So a really good athlete played his last two seasons at right tackle, which is interesting. Packers, we know, normally like to look at left tackles and shift them where they want to use them. Um, And what's fun about him is he played D-line actually in high school and he didn't transition to offense until college. So 
Some people like that. Some people don't like that. But he's relatively new to playing offensive line in general. You know, he kind of approaches it from a defensive perspective, which I think is really interesting to think about your hand placement and your footwork kind of mirroring what you did um, earlier in your career. So he, I think, would be a name for Packers fans to keep an eye on, given that he was a rumored visit already. Um, so I think some some first round due diligence there. Very interesting. He's PFF's eighth ranked tackle prospect. So certainly first round pick. Um, there are two other names that have been floating around that I want us to discuss. Um, one controversial, one not. <laughs> um, one, both have been mocked to the Packers in so many mock drafts that I have seen from national media. And I would say, just putting this out there, that like almost every mock draft that I have seen, and again, this does not mean anything because we have seen the Packers and every team go against the grain, against national pundits all the time. But almost everyone has the Packers taking an offensive lineman in round mm -hmm. one. Um, which again is super interesting because I don't, I can't even remember the last, I would love to see like the last year that they did that. I, I'm having a hard time even remembering, um, the last first round offensive lineman that they took. Um, but the two names are Amarius Mims out of Georgia and Graham Barton from Duke. And I think they're both really interesting for a lot of different reasons. You and I were talking pre-show about Amarius Mims mainly because he's the more controversial of the two, um, mainly because he's a little bit raw. He only has eight starts in his career, and that's, like, the really big one, right? Just, like, not a lot of tape to go off of. This is, like, a – look, all draft, I would say, is projections. It's looking at a prospect and saying, not what you've really put on tape, but what do I think you can do in your future? So – it's still really difficult though to project what a player can do if they've only made eight starts. This was kind of LVN's thing too, though, right? Didn't start at Iowa. Didn't seem to matter for the Packers. Doesn't seem to matter at all. He's going to probably start this coming season. Um, the other thing being that he being a developmental player, they kind of need a starter. Um, again, I don't know if that necessarily matters because if there's one team that's going to do a hell of a job taking someone with just like freaky athletic traits like Amarius Mims and turning them into a starting offensive lineman, no matter where it's going to be on the line, it's probably going to be the Packers <laughs> given their track record. So in terms of landing spots, you can't really ask for something better, but it's a gamble when it comes to him. Um, yeah. Yeah, just, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, just to piggyback off that, Tyler Guyton is in that same conversation, 14 starts. So if you look at the Packers' trajectory of taking guys that have played like three or four seasons, like thousands of snaps, you're you're looking at guys in the last two prospects we've talked about and Tyler Guyton and Amarius Mims that have less than a full season's worth of starting experience. And they're also massive. Not that that like super matters, but they are a little bit outside of Green Bay's metrics as far as their size. So that is something to keep in mind as well. We know the Packers have like very specific preferences when it comes to arm length. You know, if you have shorter arms, historically, they'll move you inside. I think like 33 inches is typically their cutoff. So just not that it means anything. We've seen the Packers break the mold, especially in the, the COVID year where they took Devontae Wyatt, who was 24 years old, which they had never done, took Quay Walker, obviously at inside linebacker, which they historically did not draft in the first round. So they do break these molds and break these tendencies, but when it comes to the offensive line prospects that they tend to covet, I think those two guys are a little bit of mold breakers there. But I agree with you. I agree with you. What are your, I um, want um, just really quickly, cause I know your dad's a Notre Dame fan. Does he ever <laughs> talk about Joe Alt? Because he is obviously the consensus number one tackle stardom day one left tackle for a decade. Like, if the Packers were, I think they'd have to move up to like seven or eight or nine to get him. So I don't think he's in the conversation, but I wondered if your dad had like ever mentioned him as the dream pick. Oh, with the dream. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I mean the absolute dream. He would, he would love, would love him. Um, my dad loves every single Notre Dame pick though. Right. So right. 
Um, no, but I mean, he he has been saying for for a while, ever since that he declared for the draft, that um, he was going to be consensus number one, like best offensive lineman that that was going to be. But he's he's going to be a stretch. Um, I think the only chance the Packers would have for getting Joe Alt would be if he slid for whatever reason. Um, and I doubt that that's going to happen. He seems to be kind of more of that generational plug and play um, offensive lineman. Um, I do want to talk about Graham Barton though, because he's an interesting one. It's a little bit different because he's not a tackle, right? He's, he, he's projected to be a center. Not that I think that that's necessarily a bad thing because we know that that position is a little bit questionable for the Packers right now, given where, Josh Myers is at in terms of his contract, but at the same time, you have uh, Zach Tom, or right, like where he can move around, and so and like you said, they kind of tend to take tackles and then place them where they want. So it's like, do you want someone who can project to be just a center or an interior guy, and is that again okay, the value pick that you want for day one? Yeah, and I mean, I think those are all the question marks because historically, no, the Packers would not prioritize an interior offensive lineman in round one. They covet them on day two. Elton Jenkins and Josh Myers are two very recent examples of taking an interior offensive lineman on day two. So with still a premium uh, premium pick, but yeah, I mean, I it's the fact that he can play all five positions, I think warrants the conversation because not only would he be your backup in the interior or potentially a starter there, but he could kick out if you needed him to. But there's also some guys that I think might be around on like pick 13, 14, 15, that if the Packers are really looking like Talicia Fuaga from Oregon State is a tackle, but he can bump inside and play guard at an elite level. So I think there's a lot of position versatility in some of these starters or some projected tackles where they could maybe kick inside, but they also could compete. Like I kind of think there's a realistic scenario at camp where the Packers draft a couple offensive linemen really high, like maybe in the first round and then maybe again in the second round or third round. And then they just have all seven dudes compete at camp. And if the mantra is always best five, like you might be talking about an offensive line that's got like, Elton Jenkins at left tackle and Talicia Fuaga at left guard. Like there's some weird combinations I think that they could come up with to just get their best five out there. I agree. I don't think they've ever necessarily cared um, who you were when you came in. Right. You know, like, like we said, like Zach Tom was a projected center and now he's their right tackle. Elton Jenkins um, didn't start his rookie season. He exactly. did with injuries, but yeah. Right. So and again, I mean, I would love to go back and look at David Bakhtiari's scouting report. Um, yeah. Wasn't his knock like his short arms or yep. something really silly like that? So, you know, you just, you really never know. And like I said, I, I feel like if there's a team that scouts and develops offensive talent, offensive line talent really well, it's the Packers. And so I trust that they're, like you said, they're going to get guys in, in camp. They're going to let them compete. They're going to let them develop and they're going to plug and play and figure it out. Look, they just spent the entire 2023 season rotating their right guard. And so, like, who knows what they're going to end up doing. But I think it's about getting in these athletic freaks. You mentioned the RAS scores. Um, and I think maybe for those who might be new to our show, should we go through what RAS is? Sure. Yeah. So relative athletic scores are becoming more and more popular when you're talking about evaluating draft prospects and draft metrics, it stands for relative athletic score or RAS or RAS, depending on who you ask, um, but was created by Math Bomb is his Twitter handle. Um, Kent Laplatte. I don't know how to necessarily pronounce his last name. I've never actually heard it said out loud, uh, but he grades prospects on four categories based on their pro days and their combine scores. One of those is size. One of them is their composite speed, um, their explosion, which counts like your vertical jump and your broad jump. And then your composite agility score, which is like your shuttle and your three cone. And then he compares them against all of the other prospects from 
God, I don't even know how far back he's gone at this point um, from previous draft classes. So it's kind of fun to get projections and say like, um, I think it's like 8.5 and above is considered elite. But mm -hmm. historically, we've seen Brian Gutekunst draft players, at least in the first couple rounds, that are designated elite, like really, really strong athletes. And then when you're talking again about like seventh rounders or undrafted free agents, it's all the elite athletes. Like at that point, if he's going to take a flyer on you, you better be a freak. <laughs> and that's typically like, that's what we've seen him do. Yes. So through this draft season, you'll hear us talk about RAS a lot, um, mainly because it is a huge, huge indication of what the Packers are going to do. Like Maggie said, historically, the Packers, especially in the early rounds, and then like she said later, they look for freak athletes. They look for high athletic ability, um, body type, agility, mobility, that is going to lead them to believe that you're going to succeed in the NFL in a way that either you're going to be developmentally, you know, successful where they can mold you or you're already there. Um, like a Devontae Wyatt, let's say, who was a little bit older, but was already kind of there in terms of his athletic gifts. Um, it is extremely rare for the Packers to take a player, um, even in free agency. You know, we talked about it this year. Um, you know, I was very high on a Jordan Poyer. You look at his relative athletic score, then you think mm, probably not because he had a very low relative athletic score. So um, just wanted to throw that out there for those new listeners. We will be using that term quite a bit. Um, a little bit of breaking news in the show um, on Twitter. It was just dropped that um, Amarius Mims was in for a top 30 visit. Okay. So again, as we just alluded to, kind of an indication that there is interest um, from the Packers on that controversial uh, offensive lineman. Um, anyone else on the line that has caught your eye or do you want to move on to skill position players? Let's move on to skill position. But the only thing I did want to mention is that the other confirmed top 30 visit for the Packers was Zach Zinter, who's a guard slash center, just an interior prospect out of Michigan. And we know the Packers also really love their prospects to have a, a strong collegiate pedigree, like Josh Myers coming from Ohio State, Zach Zinter, Michigan. They just had John Marnian Jr. from Michigan. So he did come in for a visit, probably a, a day three pick, but he was in the building. He was one of their two confirmed <laughs> offensive prospects that came in, uh, knowing that the focus has been on defense for them. Awesome. Okay. Skill position. Where do you want to start? Because I think this is where things get super interesting. I do I, too. I don't know where they would consider taking a wide receiver. I don't know when. It would be insane if that was the big magical trade up that they were going for. But I would probably, you know, bet my house that that's not the case. <laughs> Same. Running back is a need, but have no idea when and where the running backs will fall off the board. Tight end, probably not high on their list, but there's certainly some good ones on day three that can round out the room. So yeah, this is this is where it gets really interesting to me. For me, skill position players are a day two and day three. Um, those are day two and day three picks um, in my mind. I, I, I just don't see it happening on day one. Um, again, I could eat my words, who knows, but that that's just how I feel. There are some guys that I really love. Um, the chances that they take them, quite slim. Um, so, but this is our <laughs> Let's show. Hear Let's hear it, Let's yeah. This is our show, so we can do it. Um, honestly, my draft crush since, like, day one, and again, I just, I don't even, especially with what the Packers have done in free agency. Oh, I know who this is, okay. I don't feel like this is at all where they're going, but I absolutely adore Blake Corum. Like, just adore him from, like, top to bottom. He is just such a Packers player also in terms of how he carries himself and the kind of teammate that he is. But he is, he would be a tad bit redundant with what they have in their room already. Now, again, the kind of contract they gave A.J. Dillon – maybe they see Blake Corum being the future A.J. Dillon, the future RB2, and they take him on an early day three situation and 
he fills out, you know, that, that side of things. I don't know, but he is just, he's your every down guy. You know, he was that at Michigan. Um, he obviously was on a very, very talented Michigan offense. Um, I wouldn't say that he's like, you know, you're like, the one thing is like your elite athlete. But again, if you're going to take a guy on day three, I don't know if that necessarily matters for the Packers. Um, great vision, great balance, great on third down, um, would be a wonderful contributor on a team that wouldn't need him to be the number one guy, obviously with Josh Jacobs. And again, just, I think the perfect addition to this locker, this young locker room, um, he runs so hard, so hard. I mean, just so hard to bring down. Um, and I just adore him. <laughs> I like it. Um, let's see some of the other names at the very top. I think of the list, this is where it gets interesting to me, right? Is would the Packers potentially invest in arguably like one of the top three running backs in this draft who you probably have to spend a second rounder on. Don't think anybody sneaks into the first round. It's really not that kind of draft for running backs. And no. I think free agency showed us that, you know, that the priority is certainly not running backs in this class, but like Jonathan Brooks out of Texas, he is such a fascinating case study to me because he sat behind Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson. He did meet with the Packers, but he tore his ACL at the end of the season. So he didn't test at the combine or his pro day. And you're not even sure when he'd be able to play in 2024, possibly towards the end of the season, but maybe that's okay. Like maybe the Packers are fine with that because they have Josh Jacobs and AJ Dillon and they're ready to just unleash him in 2025 as the bell cow. But if they have a second round luxury pick because they have two second rounders, maybe they grab him because they think that, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze there and it's a good idea. Trey Benson, probably in that conversation for top running back, freak athlete, really high relative athletic score, 43940 time. He had a thousand yards from scrimmage in both of his, year, his seasons at Florida State. Really, really strong pass blocker, which you know Goody yeah. is going to covet and Matt LaFleur. So I don't know. I just think that it's really interesting. Like, do they get someone that they want to start right away or right. sit them? What do you think about Jalen Wright? He's interesting to me too, because he's another freak athlete. Really good explosion. And he's so young. He was born in 2003. God, that makes me feel old. <laughs> that makes me feel so old. <laughs> but yeah, another 438 kind of like speedster, really good explosion. Great um, pass protector. Yeah, good in space. Like, I think that's what we're going to look at too. My favorite, like, I don't know if he even counts as a sleeper because I've seen people talk about him a little bit more, is Tyrone Tracy out of Purdue. Okay. He played wide receiver for three years actually for four years at Iowa and then he transferred to Purdue and became a running back he is he's got experience as a kicker turner he has over 2,000 scrimmage yards and 15 touchdowns in his career so just a really fun prospect who you know has good hands Josh Jacobs wants to be more active in the passing game he said that when he met with the Packers AJ Dillon can do it but you're talking about someone who played four years of wide receiver in college and then became a running back. So he's just like a really interesting prospect and feels like a good kind of like chess piece for Matt LaFleur to do whatever he wants with as a third running yeah. back. Talk to me about hometown guy, Braylon Allen. <laughs> I feel like he's the guy that a lot of Packer fans are going to want because of that, right? Like he's fun. He set records while he was... Well, he was a Badger and rightfully so another really hard runner. Like I think he's, he was born in 2004. So if you want to talk about feeling old, he oh is God. insanely young, really intriguing too. Cause he's tall. Like he's six, two, he doesn't have the typical body type of a running back, um, but would be a really nice change of pace. Again, I think, I think the question here is like, he's 245. So he's a big yeah. back like we're talking about bit, almost as big as AJ Dillon taller than AJ Dillon so like where do you see him being utilized and like what becomes redundant because I think that was kind of the thought process going into this right is like you got to find your next Aaron Jones yeah and I don't know I don't know who that's gonna be yeah but 
is going to be a hard one to find. <laughs> probably oh. they're probably just not going to find them again, honestly. Um. All right, let's shift then to pass catchers because okay. you mentioned that there's a few tight ends that you like in the later rounds. Um, would love to hear about those and then any wide receivers. Um, to, I mean, to me, I think the the tight ends are interesting. You you and I are in agreement that we don't think there's any way like Brock Bowers, if he's sitting there in the the teens or the the twenties when the Packers trade up, like we don't think he would be the guy. No, agreed. Okay. I mean, I I'd be shocked. I know. Never say never, but I'd be shocked. <laughs> um, ben Sinnott from uh, Kansas State. I think is a fun prospect would kind of round out the room. Um, Tip Ryman from Illinois is probably primarily a blocking tight end, but like a a dog, like a really good kind of blocking tight end. So another one of those like freak athletes, he's uh, got a 9.9 relative athletic score, 271 pounds. Like, yes, a blocking tight end, right? Like it feels like an offensive lineman running down the middle of the field to catch passes. Like that's the sixth offensive line. <laughs> yeah. So I, it kind of makes me wonder how big Mercedes Lewis was. I was going to say that's, that's your, that's a big dog, but yeah, I really like him as like a, yeah, Mercedes Lewis is 276 pounds. So there wow. you go. As if you're talking about like a late round day three kind of guy, tip Ryman from Illinois can just come in and be, be this generation's big dog. And I would, I'd be all about it. Do you have any wide receiver crushes? I mean, I think everyone loves Rome. Right. Like <laughs> there's this, this certain names that you wouldn't you uh... know, but it's, it's been harder for me to dig into the wide receivers, knowing how stacked the room is. Um, it just hasn't felt like the biggest need and I'll, I'll stand by it. I think that the Packers take a wide receiver in this mm-hmm. draft. Um, it's going to be a day two, day three guy. So I would, I would encourage everyone to go listen to, you know, your Andrew Martegs and your Kyle fellows and your Brennan Ruffs and, and all those people who kind of know some of those later prospects. Um, one of those I'm going to, I don't remember who it was, totally picked that Dontavian Wicks last year. I think it was Kyle. Um, but, you know, to focus on the the higher value, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to imagine. Now, granted, like, I don't, I don't know. Like if he slides, you know, who knows? Um, if, I don't know. <laughs> if they trade back and take like a lad McConkey, I don't know. I, I just, I can't see it. I don't know how you feel about it, but I can't see it. Well, so like Xavier worthy had like one of those informal, formal meetings with the Packers, I think at the combine, it wasn't a top 30 visit or anything, but yeah. he's the one that set the combine record and ran a four two one forty. So like, would that be an interesting wrinkle Would the Packers commit that high of a, like he's taught, you're talking like an end of the first round, potential selection so would they do that I don't know it's it's really tricky to think about I really like Malik Washington out of Virginia unfortunately he's a recent transfer so he didn't actually get to play with Dontavian Wicks but he's only 5'8 so I don't think he would even be on the Packers big board but we also didn't think Jaden Reed would be on their big board last season and then they broke their thresholds to take him so really really interesting conversation surrounding the wide receivers this year because there's some really good ones, Xavier Leggett, South Carolina, but I think these are all guys that are going to get snatched up earlier than maybe we're expecting them to, because I think the run on receivers, it's such a good class that they're going to go really early. I agree. I also think, this is my take, is that the paying of the big bucks of the receivers, given where college receivers are in their development and how they're coming into the league ready to go, is just not happening. I mean, we just saw, we didn't even talk about this yet. I mean, we just saw Stephon Diggs get traded, you know, just the value. I think teams are seeing like, well, why would we pay you if we can just draft someone who's ready? I mean, right. fully ready, right? The, these guys coming in, these drafts, these rookies are, they're a different breed than we've ever seen before. 
Um, so they're going to start getting drafted higher and higher, I think, than ever before. Um, and rightfully so, if they're ready to go, you know, not don't need as much development. Um, I do think 41 might be an interesting place to keep an eye on for maybe not a, maybe not a wide receiver, but a, but a, but a skill position player. Yeah. And I mean, I think that we're going to see multiple selections on day three, Isaac Grindo from Louisville is a running back that has kind of gotten more chatter recently. Um, a lot of these guys that like don't have a ton of tread on their legs because they've either bounced around and played at multiple universities or they were behind some really explosive athletes. So they didn't get utilized as much. Like those are fun, fresh prospects to think about. Um, Isaac Grindo is fun to me because one of his RAS comps is Amon Green. And then the other one is Edgar and James. So it's like, yeah, okay, that'll do. Like <laughs> that'll, uh, that's good. Um, before we wrap have you looked at quarterbacks at all? Because I think Packers fans might hate this, but the one quarterback that I think would be so fascinating to sit behind Jordan Love and work with Matt LaFleur is Joe Milton out of Tennessee. And he's very polarizing because he is a freak, freak, freak athlete, but he doesn't have like traditionally sound mechanics. Like he's an athlete, not the best quarterback prospect. So he would need a lot of work and a lot of development because it's like, Hey, the stuff that we want you to be good at, you're not as good at, but like you're fun to watch 9.98 relative athletic score. So I just think that would be really fun. Seven rushing touchdowns in 2023, like with his legs, six, five. So that was just me thinking about like, if the Packers are going to take a quarterback to develop, go get the guy that LaFleur can mold into a really good prospect. That's a really interesting uh, guy. Um, this is going to sound crazy. I love Bo Nix. I think you mentioned that on a different show. I don't know what it is. Um, I just think he's so fun. He's such an athlete. I think I just, I love quarterbacks who can like improv with their legs. It's why we love Rogers. It's why we love Jordan. It's just like, there's something about the ability to like make things happen on your own. Um, he obviously, I think like you just mentioned, he's got like really inconsistent footwork. Um, so that obviously would need to get cleaned up. Um, but all those things, the processing, the progressions, the footwork, like you sit behind someone, you don't start, you can focus on those things, right? Um, I don't think he's not a starter right now. He could be, right. but he's not. Um, he played a lot in college. Um he's got a big arm. Like, I just think he's got all the intangibles. It's just a matter of like molding it. Do I think he's going to end up like being like the Packers starter one day? Like, no, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> right. Terribly wrong. Um, but I don't know. I uh, wouldn't hate it. I what does your dad think of uh, Sam Hartman from Notre Dame? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Hartman is a college quarterback. I just, I mean, very, you know, very good looking college quarterback. Yeah. All right. I was going to, I don't think that's Jay's scouting report, but you know. No, that's Perry Goldstein's. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts before we wrap this one up? Uh, next week, defensive prospects. I think that's what we're more excited for. I made a joke on Twitter, but that is where I want to spend all of my time. I love offensive prospects. I think it's fun to look like, you know, to, to look at, what they've done but give me the defense all the time i mean you know how i feel about this as well so if you thought this was a long episode <laughs> get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well thank you as always uh this has been super fun we cannot wait for the draft countdown um like maggie said we will be going through defensive prospects next week so stay tuned for that um our schedule is that and then i think we have a guest after that to go yeah. through a bit of a big board so and then we will do our usual seven round mock for the packers um and then it will be draft time so we are almost here guys um thank you as always for listening to the show go like subscribe download wherever you get your podcasts over on youtube packs what she said pwss podcast on twitter 
You can follow Maggie at Maggie J. Loney. You can follow me at Perry underscore Goldstein. Um, that is all for now. And as always, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.